The uh, Subcommittee on Technology and Innovation will come to order. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's hearing on the transfer of innovations that come from research uh, funded by the federal government. The federal government invests more than $135 billion each year in research and development activities, and a portion of that fund supports the majority of basic research conducted by universities. The transfer of knowledge from universities into the marketplace can have profound economic and social impacts, so we are always looking for more ways to encourage this process. I'm glad that our, our chairman uh, decided to hold this important hearing so that our subcommittee can learn about the innovation, innovative approaches that institutions across the nation are taking to accelerate the transfer of federally funded research. In fact, tech transfer has been a, a long been a priority uh, for me to to further this goal in the energy sphere, I, I drafted the Energy Technology Transfer Act, uh, which was signed into law in 2008. This legislation uh, created jobs by accelerating breakthrough uh, energy technologies out of the national labs and into the marketplace. It was based on best practices developed by agricultural extension programs at the USDA. For American universities, however, tech transfer is governed by the Buy Dole Act. Uh, December 20, uh, 2010 marked the 30th anniversary of the enactment of the Buy Dole Act, which permitted universities to uh, retain the intellectual property rights to in, in, inventions developed with federal funding. The act was passed during bleak economic conditions, not uh, too unlike those that we are facing now. The United States uh, was enduring an economic recession, uh, declining productivity, and competition from uh, Germany and, and Japan. All of this sounds familiar. The purpose of Baidol was, uh, was simple, facilitate and support uh, universities and small businesses in the commercialization of their inventions allowing uh, the society to uh, benefit and, and increasing U.S. global competitiveness. Promoting university-based innovation and technology transfer was seen as a way to combat the forces then working against the United States. Thirty years later, uh, Bai Dole still elevates these uh, efforts. The collective uh, efforts encouraged under the uh, Bay Dole Act have brought about the commercialization of many t new technological advances that impact the lives of millions uh, of people across the nation. Prior to the enactment of, of uh, Bay Dole, less than 5% of U.S. government pat patents were commercially licensed. Licensed. In 1980, 390 patents were awarded to universities. By 2009, the number increased to over 3,000. In my home state of Illinois, the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign holds nearly 400 patents and has created 61 companies. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about how university technology transfer has evolved since the passage of Bay Dole and the innovative uh, activities and partnerships uh, institutions are trying today to get more re uh, results uh, to the public. We thank each of you for being here and look forward to your testimony. Uh, let me just say that unfortunately Chairman Quayle was unable to attend t today's hearing, but I'm glad to be here and eager to hear about the innovative uh, approaches to technology transfer you're all here to, to discuss. I now recognize the gentlelady from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, for her opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the Chairman also for calling this hearing on university technology transfer. And I want to thank our witnesses for joining us here today to share your perspective on how we can get more promising research out of the university labs and right into the marketplace. I'm pleased that we're taking a serious look at this issue. I'm convinced there are a number of ways that we can strengthen and improve technology transfer in this country. There are far too many good ideas out there in our universities, good ideas that have been developed through tax, federal taxpayer support, uh, but they languish. And as we continue to look for ways to strengthen our economy and secure our global competitiveness, I think it'd be wise to focus on technology transfer. I'm excited to hear from our witnesses today about some innovative approaches to technology transfer and to discuss the ways that the federal government can facilitate these approaches, particularly interested in hearing Mr. Rosenbaum's testimony today about our experience in Maryland. The truth is there are various elements that contribute to efficient and effective technology transfer. First, you have to be able to identify research with commercial potential. This is not an easy task. It can be a significant challenge since researchers are not necessarily equipped 
to recognize commercial potential, and industry has limited exposure to all the research coming out of universities. At the same time, research may have commercial relevance in a space not initially envisioned by the researcher or recognized by industry. Finding better ways to identify ideas with commercial potential is a challenge, but one that's critical to the entire technology transfer process. Once you've identified an idea or concept with commercial potential, you have to demonstrate its technical feasibility. This is often accomplished through some sort of proof of concept research and development of a prototype. Unfortunately, there are limited financial resources for this sort of research and development. I'm pleased that the Economic Development Administration has started funding these sorts of activities through its I-6 challenges, which are generally focused on accelerating technology commercialization. And I'm also pleased that EDA announced an I-6 challenge just last week specifically on the development or expansion of proof of concept centers. Once the technical feasibility of an idea or concept is proven, we have to get that technology out of the lab and into the hands of a private sector entity that can commercialize it. In some cases, this is accomplished by the researcher leaving academia to start his or her own business. But it's often achieved by the university licensing that technology to an outside company or entrepreneur. Unfortunately, we frequently heard from industry that licensing university-developed technology is far from easy or straightforward and that often bureaucratic red tape and unnecessary time delays frustrate and in some cases deter industry altogether. Our economy can't afford to let good ideas die in university labs. We need to figure out a way to do this more seamlessly, and I'm eager to hear from our witnesses today about innovative ways of speeding up this process and making it more efficient. And finally, once the technology makes its way out of the lab, it needs to be commercialized. This may include large-scale demonstrations and the development of functional prototypes, putting together business plans and management teams and carrying out market validation activities. Certainly, these are private sector functions. However, when it comes to technology that have been developed with federal taxpayer resources, I believe the federal government may have an important role to play in facilitating the commercialization of these technologies. Our responsibility should be to ensure that federal taxpayers get the biggest bang for our buck and that technologies developed with federal resources make it across the finish line and into the marketplace. There are unfortunate limited resources for commercialization assistance for federally funded technologies. I hope today we can discuss whether there are appropriate leverage points for the federal government when it comes to commercializing these sorts of technologies. I hope our witnesses will challenge us to think more broadly. Mr. Chairman, I want to, or Madam Chair, <laughs> I want to thank you again for holding this, this hearing, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I hope we'll be following up this hearing with a separate hearing focused on technology transfer from federal labs. I'm pretty confident that there are a number of members on both sides of the aisle that are interested in taking a critical look at these efforts in ways that they can be strengthened and improved, and with that, I yield the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Edwards. If, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses, and we, then we'll proceed to hear from each of them in, in order. Our first witness is Dr. Todd Shearer, President of Association of University Technology Managers and an Associate Vice President of Research Administration at em Emory uh, University. And next, we, we will hear from Ms. Catherine Innes, who is the Director of the Office of Technology Development at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Our third witness uh, is Mr. Ken Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt is the Executive Director of Technology Transfer at the University of Michigan. Our final witness is uh, Mr. R Robert Rosenbaum, the President and Executive Director of the Maryland Technology Development Corporation. And thank you for being <coughs> our witnesses this morning. As I'm, I'm sure our witnesses know, a spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each. After all, all of the witnesses, uh, members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. And I now recognize our first uh, witness, Dr. Shear, for five minutes. Madam Chairwoman and honorable members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today uh, on the important topic of transferring university technology transfer from lab to the marketplace. 
Uh, my name is Todd Shear, and I am the president of the Association of University Technology Managers, known as Autumn. Autumn is an international organization with more than 3,000 members, primarily university technology transfer professionals, <clears throat> who come from over 300 universities, research institutions, and teaching hospitals. I also head the technology transfer office at Emory University, and my office is responsible for managing a portfolio of around 1,000 biomedical inventions made by Emory faculty. We work clo closely with our faculty inventors to evaluate early stage technologies for commercial potential, determine the best intellectual property protection strategy, and market our technologies through a variety of channels in hopes of finding a corporate partner. If we find an interested company, then we negotiate appropriate contractual partnerships to ensure that our inventors, our universities, and taxpayers benefit from the ultimate products. After licenses are signed, we maintain relationships throughout the life of the agreement, sometimes insisting upon return of our technology should our partner decide to abandon its development. As a result of Emory's passion and commitment to commercializing its technology, over 90% of HIV-infected patients in the U.S. and Europe on life-saving antiviral therapy take a drug, drug developed by our researchers. In the decades leading up to the 1980 Bayh-Dole Act, the federal government accumulated title to approximately 28,000 patents, of which fewer than 5% were licensed to companies for commercialization. Unless an exception was granted, the ownership of inventions was kept centrally at the federal agencies from which they were funded. The passage of the Bayh-Dole Act boldly changed government patent policy, providing ownership and control to any invention made with federal funds to the very universities and small businesses that made them. Since its passage, the Bayh-Dole Act has proven instrumental in recognizing that federal patent policy is an integral part of U.S. competitiveness, and it is the envy of nearly every country in the world as evidenced by similar legislation in a wide variety of countries, including South Africa, India, China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Its beauty is that it aligns ownership and control of patent rights to create incentives for universities, researchers, and companies to develop and invest in patenting and licensing their new technologies. Without local pride of ownership and control created by the Act, many of these discoveries would still be languishing on the shelf and no revenues would be returned to fund even more research. According to an article published in the journal Nature, an invention made by an academic in the United States has a better chance of going to market than it does in other nations. Since the Bayh-Dole Act was passed, more than 5,000 new companies have formed around university research, the majority of which are located in close proximity to the university. In fiscal year 2010, university research helped create an, on average 1.7 new companies a day. University technology transfer creates billions of dollars of direct benefits to the U.S. economy every year. In fiscal year 2010, universities helped create 657 new products. According to the former president of NASDAQ, an estimated 30% of its value is rooted in university-based, federally funded research results. Technology transfer is not perfect. After all, we work at the riskiest of all stages in the innovation pathway when funding and resources are hardest to find. The odds of any particular technology making it to market are astronomical. So figuring out what works has not been easy and has taken time. Despite the challenges of working at the discovery phase, the academic community and federal agencies continue to find better ways to manage innovations. Technology transfer offices are constantly adapting to changes in the economy, learning best practices from each other, and understanding the marketplace. Technology transfer offices have expanded their service to help faculty create new companies. They are creating accelerators, finding gap funding, encouraging entrepreneurship by faculty and students, and rewarding that entrepreneurship. While TTOs focus on negotiating licenses, that is just the means to an end. The end is to get technologies out the door and into the market for the benefit of the public. Not all technology transfer offices have the same level of experience, but they have more resources to turn to than ever before. Universities from across the country are already working with smaller tech transfer offices to help them improve their technology transfer function. Autumn will continue its commitment to providing training and education for technology transfer professionals for years to come. We will provide networking events for our members to share best practices and technology transfer, as we all expect new practices to continue to emerge just as they always have. Our members must continue to strive to find new ways to reduce the barriers to getting our technology from lab to market. We believe that continued support for research at NIH, NSF, and other agencies, such as the newly formed NCATS, is the best way that the federal government can encourage even more commercialization of American technologies. Autumn, as well as other organizations, believe that the U.S. technology transfer system will continue to be the catalyst for innovation in the U.S. economy for many decades to come. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Shear. Uh, Ms. Ines, Ines you're uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Bigger, Ranking Member Edwards, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to provide testimony on the challenging, unpredictable, and oftentimes rewarding process of moving good ideas from university labs to the marketplace. My name is Catherine Innes, and I'm the Director of the Office of Technology Development at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I am responsible for patenting and commercializing promising new in inventions arising from our research endeavors. My testimony today focuses on the implementation and success of the Carolina Express License Agreement, which is a one-size-fits-all approach to licensing technologies to UNC startup companies. In early 2009, UNC began internal discussions among faculty and research administrators on what could be done to stimulate and increase the volume of new companies starting around UNC technologies and how the process could be streamlined. We wanted to start more companies and help them become sustainable. However, we were constrained by limited financial resources and unable to invest in these ventures. Instead, we focused on finding ways to make the license process faster, easier, and more transparent so that startups could more readily get up and running. UNC formed a committee comprised of serial entrepreneurial faculty members, licensing staff, general counsel, and a local venture capitalist to consider what we might do. They reviewed the terms of previous startups and determined the historical range of financial terms and equity positions, both at the time of license and at the point of a liquidity event. Our data indicated that all of our past deals had been actually very similar and that by the time an equity was liquid, the university's share was less than 1%. The committee arrived then at a set of financial terms that the stakeholders agreed would be fair to all parties and would not need to be renegotiated for the company to attract financing. Minimizing the need to renegotiate was an important objective as the negotiation process can be both time consuming and costly for all involved. A significant factor in the successful launch of this program was the buy-in from three local law firms that work with the majority of our startup companies. They agreed to forfeit the fees they would normally receive to negotiate individual deals with the university and recommend their clients sign the express license. While in part altruistic, the firms all expect their businesses will grow in the long run as we increase the rate at which we are starting new companies. Another key feature of the express license is that it is optional. If a company wants a different deal, they are free to negotiate that deal with the university as usual. To qualify for the express license, the company must have a UNC faculty, student, or staff member as one of the founders, and the company must submit a business plan for review and approval by the university. The financial terms of the license agreement are modest, but we believe fair for the stage of development of the technologies being licensed. One of the most unique features of the agreement is that in lieu of taking equity, the university receives a cash payout of 0.75% of the value of the company at a liquidity event. Typically universities take equity in their startup companies, but we felt the cash payoff when the company goes public or is acquired is much less burdensome than dealing with a stock issuance and we end up at the same overall value point. The full text of the Carolina Express license and related program documents can be found on my office's website and I have provided that URL in my written testimony. As with any new and different approach, there are supporters and critics. Our model was unique when first implemented because it offered the same set of terms to all startups regardless of technology. Many licensing professionals felt that the financial terms should vary by technology or should offer a greater return to the university. These are relevant points and questions each institution should ask in considering the implementation of a standard licensing program. We have found the program to be very effective and it serves our objective of starting more companies. In the two and a half years since inception, UNC has launched 19 startup companies around intellectual property, all but three use the Carolina Express license. We have more than doubled the number of new companies forming each year. At this time, all these companies are still in existence, although most are struggling with fundraising. We have learned through this process that most of our companies cannot repay the university for patent expenses on time and thus we must carry these costs for them for much longer than anticipated. This is straining our internal resources, but we believe starting companies is important and we continue to explore new ways to support this effort. Many of our companies have gotten started by winning SBIR grants and we very much value this program. In summary, I strongly believe that a standard licensing program can work for universities, particularly for licenses to startups. 
For a one-size-fits-all program to be successful, the university must be willing to settle for a fair deal rather than the most lucrative deal. It is also important to establish criteria for when the standard agreements can be used, and perhaps more importantly, when they cannot. Finally, to implement a standard agreement that is intended to work for many deals, it is essential for the university to gain the support and buy-in of those negotiating on behalf of the other side of the deal, because just floating a standard that one party thinks is workable will not likely get much traction. Thank you again, Madam Chairwoman and subcommittee members for the opportunity to appear before you today. I stand ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Innes. Uh, Mr. Nisbet, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak to you today on the important topic of technology transfer and the importance to the American public. I'm Ken Nisbet, Executive Director of Tech Transfer at the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan has a well-deserved reputation for excellence in the breadth and depth of its research activities, with over $1.2 billion of research expenditures annually. While having a robust pipeline of research discoveries is an ingredient for tech transfer success, it's only one component of, of many. A critical factor is support from university leadership to provide the resources and encouragement for tech transfer and entrepreneurship. Our President Mary Sue Coleman, our executive officers, our deans, and others regularly communicate the importance of our tech transfer activities with our faculty, our students, our staff, and alumni. Each year, our faculty report to our office over 300 new discoveries that form a diverse portfolio of technologies and market applications. We enter into over 100 different agreements with our industry partners annually and spin out an average of one new startup every five weeks, most of which stay in Michigan. We also strive to measure what is even more important, the impact of our technologies and our activities on our communities, our people, and our nation. There are a lot of good ideas to enhance tech transfer, but it's important to tailor these initiatives to account for the advantages and the challenges of a particular region. I want to highlight three particular efforts that we believe are making a big difference at the University of Michigan. The first involves changes and investments we've made within our office and our university to improve our operational effectiveness. The second is using early stage development funding to reduce the technical and market risk of our early stage innovations. And the third is enhancing our access to talent to speed the deployment of our technologies and the formation of our startups. Over the last 10 years, we've revamped our office culture by attracting and training tech transfer professionals with technical and market skills and an appreciation for creativity, risk taking, and customer service. We've simplified our work documents and processes to make working with others more rapid, effective, and friendly. We've standardized agreements for some situations, for example, software and research tool licensing, but we find it important, given the wide diversity of technology opportunities and business models, to be flexible and nimble for the value propositions required by our partners. We've established a full service venture creation capability within our office called the Venture Center to more effectively form great startups for our entrepreneurs and our investors, and to make it easier to do business with the university. We've changed university policies and practices to motivate our faculty to engage with industry and to participate in commercialization activities. We form broader industry research agreements with innovation partners such as Procter & Gamble, Dow, and Ford, and we've addressed industry needs for predictability and flexibility with a new program, the Michigan Research Advantage, that provides upfront license terms for future inventions that may be derived from industry-sponsored research. We've expanded the funding resources available for our early-stage technologies and new startup opportunities. Our university has several translational funds that allow technical validation for emerging discoveries. One example is the Culture Translational Fund for Promising Biomedical Innovations, created via a matched endowment from the Coulter Foundation. Complementing our translational funds, the university is reinvesting our tech transfer revenues into an internal GAP fund that's generously matched with funds from the state of Michigan to address market validation and commercial readiness issues. And recently, we established a program called MINTS, Michigan invests in new technology startups in which the university, alongside a qualified venture firm, is investing endowment funds in promising U of M startups. Having access to high quality talent is a key ingredient for success, and we focused our efforts to create several effective talent initiatives. We've recruited and trained graduate students and postdocs to provide technology assessments and market analysis to enable our licensing professionals to make quicker decisions and find more potential partners. We've also pioneered a program to embed within Tech Transfer a team of seasoned entrepreneurs, our mentors and residents, to assist our efforts. The result has been improved venture creation capabilities and a stream of high quality, sustainable startups that are creating jobs and providing superior investment returns. And seeing the positive impact of our U of M talent programs over the last five years, 
We recently proposed and received state funding for a tech transfer talent network. With six other Michigan universities, we are sharing and creating talent tools, resources, and activities tailored to their regions to accelerate tech transfer success for their institutions. In conclusion, at the University of Michigan, we are firmly committed to continual improvement of our tech transfer capabilities and sharing of our findings to maximize the impact of research discoveries on our economy and our quality of life. As U of M President Coleman has said, universities bring ideas to life, but it is technology transfer that gives them wings and lets them fly. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. Uh, Mr. Rosenbaum, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, we have heard today so far from, from three folks with primarily academic focus. Uh, I bring a little bit different focus, uh, never been employed by a university, uh, always been in the private sector, and now I'm with a, a quasi-public entity. I'm Rob Rosenbaum, president of the Maryland Technology Development Corporation, proud to be representing the state that was recently named number one for entrepreneurship in the country by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the home for many billions of dollars of federal research money both in our universities and federal labs. Uh, as heading up an intermediary organization, uh, we look at ourselves first and foremost as partners to the tech transfer offices. There are a lot of elements that go into getting a business or technology into a business. Tech transfer is one of the steps. Intermediaries provide many other skills and opportunities that don't exist within the university offices and often don't exist within the entrepreneurs that are trying to commercialize these technologies. So it is us intermediaries, it's us folks that can get in there and help them and teach them and train them on the things that they need to do. The other important difference for intermediaries versus other constituents and stakeholders in the process is that we are specifically and directly incentivized to do tech transfer, to create jobs, to create economic development. Uh, we're not there to create income for the universities. We're not there to put our names on patents, and we're not there to take the fame for a successful IPO. We are there to create jobs, and that is our primary role. One of the things that we help do is deal with the difficulties of university culture, and, and I think it's fair to say that uh, universities have a very distinct culture in and of themselves, and the researchers within those universities have a particular headset in and of themselves. Primarily speaking, and historically speaking, although it is changing, researchers within universities are very risk averse. They enjoy doing research, they enjoy the comforts of their labs, they enjoy creating basic knowledge, and they've been incented to do this over the years. Universities are slowly changing their culture and changing the incentives to get researchers to be a little bit more risk-taking. Programs such as sabbaticals to take job creation and job company formation to reality. Programs that include tenure as part of, uh, include commercialization as part of tenure tracks are all important. Also, the university culture is one of fairly complex and Byzantine rules and regulations. Uh, intermediaries help the entrepreneurs who have never even known the existence of tech transfer offices to understand what's going on, to help them understand what an express license is versus trying to uh, negotiate their own. So we play an important role in that respect. We, we incentivize behavior, we believe in incentiv incentivizing behavior, and we believe that the federal policies can do such things. We believe that activities such as job uh, credits for job creation and commercialization on the commercial side, on the private sector side, would leverage public dollars with private dollars in order to introduce and exaggerate the activity of private sector organizations. We believe that there is a, an opportunity for grant set-asides for commercial enterprises to do tech transfer. SBIR programs are there to uh, promote commercial activities, but they're not targeted at tech transfer. They could be targeted at tech transfer. Some of the samples and examples of these successes in Maryland, and one of the uh, programs that I think is, a, is known to the committee members is the Maryland Innovation Initiative, which is a new program that uh, aggregates five research universities with a unique process of mining technologies and utilizing an intermediary 
to bring those technologies to the public and to bring the entrepreneurs together with those technologies. We have also had experience in forming foundations that can be an aggregator for private sector dollars to be brought to universities or federal labs in order to promote private sector involvement and commercialization of technologies. We have many, many more examples and we have created hundreds of companies and thousands of jobs and would be happy to answer any further questions you have on our specific successes or any other subjects. Thank you. I thank the uh, witnesses for their testimony and uh, reminding members that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair will at this point open the round of uh, questions and I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, this is a question uh, for, I guess, whoever wants to answer, and I hope you all do. <laughs> uh, in, in considering uh, in a, inventions to accelerate technology transfer, what do, you, what do you set as your target metric? New businesses, products, uh, patents, profit, citations, uh, de and then depending on the metric, how does the metric influence the inter intervention? Uh, Dr. Shear? You have any comment on that? Yeah, it's um, it's it's a great question. Uh, the way I view that, and the way I articulate it to my staff and my office is that we're deal makers, and so the important thing for us to do is to get a deal done, whether that's with a startup company or an established company, uh, because that's the beginning uh, of how we transfer our technology. Uh, there's a lot that goes on in a relationship with the startup or an established company once the license is signed. Okay, uh, Ms. Innes. Thank you. Yes, much like uh, Dr. Scheer, we have the same philosophy. Our goal is to get technologies licensed because if we can't get a commercial partner, those good ideas are going to sit on our shelves. So our most important metric would be tra getting that deal done, whether it be to a university startup or to an existing firm. So we look for technologies that have a market opportunity and try to position them and find the partners. So those are our most important activities. And uh, Mr. Nesbitt, you've had a, a lot of, it sounds like, companies and well to, uh, companies that are well entrenched already that you've dealt with. Right, and, and our approach is similar, that we do look for having agreements, and, and not just an agreement, but a good agreement with either an existing company or a startup. I think our measure is both to have a quantity of agreements showing that transfer of technology, but also trying to measure the impact that the agreement and, the, and our technology will play in an American public. And we feel that's far more important than the revenue. If you do a successful job, the revenues will follow. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rosenbaum? Yes. Uh, substantially different from the universities, our incentive and the way we measure is economic development. Are we creating jobs? Are we creating revenues? Are we creating tax base? And one of the things we look at is, is capital that's brought into our state as a result of our activities. And, and we bring $43 for every dollar we spend back into the state. So uh, that is a huge measure for us and, and our primary goal. And certainly job creation is, is very important to us, and thank you for, for what, you're, what you're all doing. Uh, but should technology transfer be a priority for every university? Uh, is it likely to be a, a profitable business uh, for any but the major uh, research institutions? Mr. Nesbitt, I think you right. could, could um, answer that. That's a great question because I think that the uh, potential of tech transfer at a particular institution is dependent on a number of factors. Obviously, you have to have a stream of quality research and researchers that form the, the pipeline of those opportunities. But I think the ecosystem also that the uh, institution resides in is very important. So we have worked with our sister universities in Michigan trying to adapt some of the practices we've found that have worked in the Ann Arbor area. We tried to figure out a way to kind of uh, influence things and, and augment their resources to do a better job. In the end, it's a very patient business. And, and trying to go after it just for money is, I think, short-sighted because it takes so long. But the long-term uh, potential of job creation and economic opportunity is, is very vital. Are there any other reasons uh, for uh, the tech technological uh, transfer that's important uh, to an institution? There are tremendous side benefits to tech transfer besides the engagement and the attraction and, and recruitment of uh, key faculty. It also is a wonderful way for students who are finding it more and more important for them to engage in these activities. So it's a wonderful learning opportunity. It's a great attraction opportunity. It has wonderful opportunities for engagement with the industry and other partners. It's a great way to engage with industry, which brings also great learnings. 
So there's a, a number of, of reasons besides the direct tech transfer activity itself that brings benefits back to the institution in the region. Thank you. You know, with the research, and I know uh, sometimes with the labs that you know the, the m m funding runs out. What happens then? And you, uh, Ms. Innes, you've got uh, a contract or, or whatever and, and, and a license. What happens if, or that the research just doesn't go anywhere? Those are very real questions. Thank you. Uh, we do our best to help the companies. If there are small companies, we help them get on their feet. We give them payment plans. We do everything we can to keep them moving forward because I think, as my colleagues have said, we are really trying to see these technologies advance because we want to see an impact from our research. But it is very difficult. We spend money on patents that we end up not being able to license or that companies can't pay us for. And that, that unfortunately, is just a cost of doing this business. Uh, we try to make more good decisions than bad and try to choose wisely and invest wisely. And I think to a large extent, we do. But there are difficulties, and, and again, as we hit them, we try to work through them. And so we're pretty flexible in our licensing terms. We want to work with a company if they've hit hard times or cannot pay to try to find a solution, and maybe it's, a, again, a longer term to pay us back. Okay, thank you. And, uh, my time is up. Uh, Ms. Edwards, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. I mean, I think it's really been clear that um, all of us agree that the Bayh-Dole Act was really transformational in terms of uh, university research and moving toward commercialization. But in recent years, a number of very provocative ideas have been thrown out about ways to modify Bayh-Dole. And some of those include allowing the federal government to recoup some of its investment if a federally funded technology is successfully commercialized. Others include allowing researchers to choose a third party or themselves to negotiate license agreements for commercialization or establishing regional technology transfer offices. And of course there are others. And so I wonder if each of you would just briefly comment on some of these concepts or others that would challenge the status quo and discuss uh, why they are or are not good ideas. Dr. Scherer. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. I'll speak first to the uh, concept of potentially allowing researchers to uh, control or make a decision about who would manage their intellectual property, a concept which is sometimes referred to as free agency. Uh, I think that's a bad uh, concept, and the reason uh, that I think it is is because it adds additional negotiation time to an already pretty burdensome process because by definition you have to add at least one more negotiation to whatever negotiations are going to follow and that is a negotiation between the home institution uh, and the party that's going to now manage that intellectual property. Uh, I think it's best to keep incentives aligned uh, between the university and the faculty member at which uh, the invention was created. Uh, and I also think that that kind of a system could potentially, we could see more of our innovation move out of state. Uh, because you tend to engage the experts and the money and the people uh, around you where you're putting the deal together and if it's being managed out of state or across the country, I would argue that that would be where uh, things would have a tendency uh, to be concentrated. Thank you. Ms. Ennis? Um, yes, thank you. I think a number of initiatives that would be very helpful, in particular I wanted to talk about the regional tech transfer offices. I think in areas where you have a number of smaller universities who may not have the, a large research base and can't really sustain an office, that could be very helpful. Those are some th initiatives we've talked about in North Carolina for our, our large university base where we have tech transfer offices in place at six of the larger of the 16 institutions. Um, I'm not in favor of free agency. I just don't see that as workable. I know myself I would have no capacity to take on innovations from another university from a free agency. Times are tough. Finances are tight. I'm going to use my resources to support the best and brightest coming out of my own institution. So I think that's just not a workable situation for us. And honestly, I think most faculty, but very few, would be skilled negotiators for themselves. I think we offer a very value-added service and we're helping protect their interests. We're helping them find a good deal and a favorable deal. So I think we add value in that process. So I think there, there are ways to enhance this and um, those would be, my focus would be helping the regional offices get created. Thank you. Mr. Nesbitt? I'll also address that regional question. Um, I think it's a good one because I, I think one size does not fit all in terms of how you do it. Sometimes it makes sense to have something centralized within a region but often I find that the hub-and-spoke model of cooperation is better. 
We've recently had some experiences because our state government has provided some funds to encourage just that, that partnering amongst some of the neighboring uh, Michigan schools. And it's worked very well, in particular, helping to fund, find the talent and fund the talent that helps with the evaluation of new opportunities to help with the venture creation activities, finding and prospecting for new licensees, especially in the execution of those relationships. And I think it's important to note, though, that we found that the strength of those regional centers, the pride in their, in their ownership, the, the links to their own alumni are very important to, to maintain. So that's one reason why I'm, I'm in favor of a hub and spoke model to try to have the best of both worlds. Thank you. Mr. Rosenbaum? I guess with my background, I'm going to follow the money. Uh, you mentioned the federal government recovering some of their uh, investment in the research. And my concern with that is there are different motivations for every entity and institution, and money is a huge driver. And when you redirect money, you're going to redirect incentives and you're going to redirect efforts. And while it may be beneficial to see some of that money come back to the federal labs that have done that research, I don't think in the grand scheme of things it's going to be a significant number of dollars on the federal side, but I think there's going to be some significant changes in behavior at the research side, at the university side, that could be adverse. So I'd be very worried about uh, making changes like that. Uh, thank you. My time's expired. Uh, thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hulgren, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Biggert. Uh, Thank you all for being here today. A uh, couple questions. First, uh, Dr. Scherer, wondered um, with the autumn annual licensing survey, I wondered what the biggest surprise you have found uh, from uh, autumn, and uh, just wondering if you're seeing any trends that encourage you uh, or anything that disturbs you really from the findings from autumn, the uh, I guess Association of University Technology Managers annual licensing survey. So I wondered if you could uh, give me any thoughts on that. I'd be happy to. We just completed 20 years uh, of uh, holding and conducting the licensing survey uh, and I had a chance to look over uh, some of the trends of that data for the last 20 years. We don't have 20 years worth of data points for every question within the licensing survey. Uh, the one result that I found most surprising was that if you look at the, and it's in my uh, the attachment of my materials, uh, if you look at the, um, the rate of federal research funding over the last 20 years, you can see, there, see there's been a very steep and steady uh, increase in federal funding. And what I found amazing was how closely the number of new invention disclosures mirrors that curve. Again, it's on a different scale, uh, but the shape of those lines uh, is, and the increase of those lines is, is very similar. We've always said that the amount of federal funding drives the amount of tech transfer that we expect to see at our universities, but I didn't expect the data to, to, to mirror each other that closely. Um, the other interesting thing is that everything sort of follows from it. As we get more inventions disclosures, we file more patents. As we file more patents, we get more issued patents. As we negotiate more licenses, we, get, we see more products uh, on the market, and we've, uh, we're, we're actually awaiting some new job data that's going to be released tomorrow at the Bio-International meeting uh, in Boston uh, with calculations of, of jobs created as a result of that licensing revenue. Great. Thank you. I wonder open this up to any of you that would have some thoughts on this, but uh, one of my passions is, again, encouraging young people uh, uh, to go into research and science. Uh, and wonder, just as we're considering ways to help faculty and students transfer more of the technology that they conduct research on, wondered from uh, your perspective, uh, are younger faculty more open to spending time on technology transfer? Um, have you seen that institutions have built technology transfer into their tenure award system? or? What approaches could we do, uh, to, and that have you seen, um, to catch future faculty at earlier stages in their careers to encourage them in this process of technology transfer? Yes, uh, I think that's a great question because we are seeing efforts to try to engage both the younger faculty mm -hmm. in particular, but also some of the students, the postdocs and the grad students who are engaged in these research activities. They are very much interested in engaging in these both for career opportunities but also for learning and for their own networking purposes. At the University of Michigan, we make it a point to try to reach every new faculty that, and to make sure that they're acquainted with our office and the advantages. We've been surprised that sometimes in the recruiting trips from faculty to Michigan, they're actually looking for our capabilities, and it's one of the factors in the decision. So that's always great. We're looking for ways to try to engage students in particular in this through internships. The fellows uh, program that I mentioned is a great way to bring in grad students and postdocs and introduce them to new opportunities and the thought process, the decision process that uh, shows their attraction in the marketplace. 
And we're now trying to experiment with an opportunity to take postdocs who often have challenging academic career decisions, and if they're interested in following a commercialization path through a new company that we've licensed or into an existing company, to provide some funding to give them that path to see if that might be the career decision they'd like to make. So all of those things are very important for the culture of the university, for the vibrancy of the region, and for our activities in tech transfer. I would also like to comment that we've done a number of programs as well at the university. We do factor in um, participation in the patenting and, and invention disclosure process as part of promotion and tenure decisions. I think that's very important to get our faculty engaged. And it's, we're seeing a lot of activity towards this coming out of the departments. They're very interested in innovation. They're very interested in seeing an impact from their research. We've also d developed a program for an entrepreneurship minor for students in the College of Arts and Sciences, and it is our most popular minor to date. We also have a program where we're teaching how to start a company through our business school, and that's accessible to all faculty, students, and staff. It's in the evening, and it's free. So we're really trying to promote this. As part of our new Innovative Carolina fundraising campaign, we also intend to uh, some of the money is going towards innovation faculty so that we can really extend and consider this opportunity. Thank you. I'm going I'm to ask one more question real quick. My time's running down, but I'd love to get some quick comments on one last thing. Many of you have talked about programs that allow business people to come alongside faculty and to assist in commercialization process here. wondered if you could just briefly talk about best practices that you've seen to help us do that. One area of the best practice is, is to have uh, an entrepreneur in residence type of program where you bring a skilled industry expert uh, into the university and let them spend X period of time, maybe six months, uh, and you work with them to meet, to meet with faculty and potentially find an opportunity that they would spin out into a company. We also use entrepreneurs and local business people to help us make tough decisions if we're deciding on whether or not a technology we should continue with that. If the licensing is stagnant, we gather their expertise, help us redirect the technology, help us find some way to help the company if necessary. Very valuable resource. And quickly, we, we took an approach of a mentor in residence. We changed it because rather than follow one technology, we wanted them to have a portfolio of technologies like staff. It's been great with assessment and some great for faculty consulting, and it's really enhanced our capabilities. And, and finally, real quickly, before we uh, fund any project that's a tech transfer or otherwise, we engage outside industry experts to help evaluate the viability of it. So we are, uh, we're making sure that there's a commercial viability before we spend the dollars. Well, thank you again. Thanks for your speed answers there. Uh, but uh, appreciate it so much. Appreciate you being here, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, the gentlelady from Oregon, Mrs. Uh, Bonamici. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I have the privilege of representing a district in Oregon that includes part of what's known as the Silicon Forest. Uh, we have trees and more rain. Uh, the, the important work that uh, is conducted by our high-tech sector there is really exciting. Uh, of particular importance to the state is the Oregon Nanoscience and Microtechnologies Institute, which is affectionately known as ONAMI. Uh, it's a signature research center that's an academic, business, and government collaboration uh, that grows research volume and commercialization in the broad area of nano and micro scale science and engineering. Since its inception in 2003 and through uh, last year, they've leveraged more than $185 million in federal and private dollars, created 21 startups with $70 million in venture and capital funding. They employ 86 full-time uh, people and support another uh, 1,700 jobs through research grants. They've created $290 million in revenue and filed 211 invention disclosures and received 21 patents in nanoscience and microtechnology. So I can tell you from looking at this record that they've been a key player in our community. So I'd like to ask our witnesses, how do you work with any external partners like Onami to accelerate commercialization? Well, I, I can't resist taking that question because I hail from Oregon myself uh, and ran the tech transfer program at the University of Oregon and Oregon Health Sciences University, uh, where I was born and raised uh, before coming to Georgia in 2003. Uh, so I missed Onami, <clears throat> and I know a number of great things have happened uh, since I left the state. Uh, one of the things uh, that we do in Georgia and, and do quite successfully, and it's similar to what you're describing as we work with the Georgia Research Alliance, which is money that comes out of the state. 
um, and helps provide valuable uh, risk capital uh, for early stage projects with the goal of creating new companies that are going to build a workforce uh, in Oregon. In order to do that, we not only sit down with, the, with experts at the Georgia Research Alliance, uh, but through that program we engage some of the entrepreneurs I was talking about a moment ago. <clears throat> and we also work closely with sister institutions uh, throughout the state because we all compete uh, and participate in this, um, uh, this Venture Lab program. Thank you. Anyone else? Similarly, we work very closely with the biotech sector in North Carolina. We have the North Carolina Biotech Center. They're helping us with technology transfer grants, with loans to startup companies, and a number of programming to foster the innovation coming out in the large bioscience sector in our region. Terrific. In a similar vein, we have an organization called Ann Arbor Spark, which is a public-private entity that is a collaboration with the university and with government and industry. It actually, interestingly, was formed as a result of a recommendation from my Tech Transfer National Advisory Board that we're looking for ways to enhance our tech transfer performance, and we talked about some of the ecosystem advantages that we were lacking. We have a very close relationship. We serve on the board. Um, they focus on things that we also focus on, business development and attraction, business acceleration, talent and funding, and, and of course, marketing of our region. So it's a very close collaboration. Uh, it also has a, an extension into our state government with our Michigan Economic Development Corporation. So very similar outcomes, slightly different format. Excellent. And I, and I dare say TEDCO is one of those aggregators and accumulators of, of skills and technologies. Um, we actually, because we are not aligned with a specific university, a specific corporation, or a specific uh, interest or stakeholder, we can actually aggregate and do aggregate resources from around the state and are able to convene groups of folks that wouldn't otherwise be able to get together. We sit on the boards of every incubator in the state. We sit on the board of every tech council in the state. We're involved with every tech transfer office in the state, both federal and university. And we very often and easily can bring a cross-section of all those constituents to the table in order to collaborate in a very unthreatening manner. Terrific. And, and just as a follow-up to the earlier response about how do we in inspire and involve, especially the students, uh, and I know Dr. Scheer will be proud of this, the University of Oregon has a technology entrepreneurship program. It's a year-long program uh, in which business, law, and science graduate students work together to evaluate new technologies for commercial potential, and then they develop a business plan. It's led to the creation of several successful companies since its inception in 2003, so that, that's a, a good partnership of bringing uh, groups together. And I'm almost out of time, but I wanted to ask Mr. Nesbitt, uh, you mentioned that the University of Michigan's changed policies and practices to motivate faculty to engage more with industry. Can you talk about the challenges that researchers faced when engaging with, with industry and participating in commercialization activities? Yes. Uh, often it's because of the nature of their research interests and, and the interest of the organization that's uh, from industry. What we found, actually, it wasn't so much the terms uh, that were really uh, important. It was the predictability and the timeliness, as you mentioned. So that's why we formed this recent initiative called the Michigan Research Advantage. And we, we, it's, again, optional, and sometimes the industry does not want it. But what we try to do is to come up with a way of, of predetermining the license terms before the invention is even created, which is, of course, quite difficult. But we find that when we bound the opportunities and bound their cost, it leads to a much richer relationship with industry, which leads to a lot of other advantages. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Lu Lujan, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and appreciate you calling this hearing. Um, Dr. Scherer, I very much appreciate you bringing to light the correlation behind the investment into tech transfer and the number of licenses that are being yielded. Um, sometimes we don't have to look far to see the importance of investments in tech transfer. And I think we all certainly agree, including uh, most of us on this committee, about the significance of what tech transfer can yield for the United States economy. Um, does everyone here, is there anyone that would disagree uh, with the statement that uh, the future of the economy in the United States can be strengthened through more robust investments and collaboration with the federal government, universities, and our national labs in the private sector in developing tech transfer. I appreciate that because uh, this is something that if the United States was serious about, and I'll just note the record that no one disagreed with that, Madam Chair. Um, the seriousness behind this is what can we do to churn this up? Herein lies an opportunity when we've seen a loss 
of manufacturing in the United States or even on that assembly line. On the front line, the innovation yields that we reap um, that were highlighted in a book, Make It in America, by the former CEO of Dow Chemical or the CEO from Dow Chemical talks about the need to be able to bring that back. But in the realm of tech transfer specifically, um, what are the right metrics to use in judging the success of technology transfer? Just looking at the number of patents and licenses is not, I think, sufficient to understand the effect on the economy. And also, wouldn't it be helpful to have longitudinal studies that would look over time at the impacts of technologies? I ask anyone. Dr. Mr. Rosenblum? Yes, we actually, uh measure our tech transfer programs not by the number of licenses because every project we fund is a tech transfer license, but we track our companies longitudinally for job creation, total revenue, tax base, and are proud to say that with the right support, these young companies can beat the averages. We have 82% of our companies still in existence after five years, which is off the charts compared to most startup companies in the country. Mr. Nisbet? I think that's a, a very important point that we, tr we also try to, I think the quantity is important, by the way. The number of agreements, the number of startups does show that the number of shots on goal. But it's also important to measure the impact of what occurs. And I think part of it is going to be the follow-on job opportunities and tax raise. That's a very long-term process, though. And it's very difficult to measure that when your technology is going to existing companies, which is common. Instead, what we try to do is to tell stories, show stories of the inventors, of the inventions, of the technologies and the companies and try to show the impact on the American people. I think that's one great way to motivate people. And uh, in the end, what you're trying to do is to promote more engagement, which what you want to do is have some very careful ways of marketing and reaching to all of your channels, including your alumni, which are quite valuable, to get them to work with the universities and to get your technologies out into the, into the marketplace. I would um, just add that I've, I've always felt like new products on the market is the ultimate validation of any tech transfer program, uh, because that's really what it's all about. Um, and used to think that it didn't really matter whether it was a startup or an established company <clears throat> because it's just a means to an end and the end is to get the end goal is to get products on the market but in this jobless economy uh, talking about jobs has become much more important uh, we do know from an old bio study that about 279,000 jobs were created between 1996 and 2007 as a result of, of the licensing revenue and the products uh, put on the market through universities uh, and hospitals uh, and so I would still advocate that products are, are, are a very important metric that we track uh, and that we need to get deals done so that our partners can get products on the market. I would emphasize that it's also, I agree with everything that we've said, it's here on the, the with my colleagues, it's important to get the products on the market, absolutely, that's the number one. Licensing is a measure of how well you're reaching your contacts. But I think it's also important to recognize this is an extremely long-term process, especially if you're in early stage therapeutics and biotech. So the return on investment is likely to come 10, 15, even late years later. So it's important to recognize it's a, it's a number of things that have to come together. It's not one metric or another. Thank you. And I have some other questions I'll be submitting to the record. But um, given the light, we heard a little bit about SBR today. Um, we don't talk much about STTR a program that has been terribly neglected by the federal government when I would suggest the importance of what we could be doing with small businesses around small business technology transfer programs. Um, could STTR be reprogrammed to be able to better work with small businesses, universities, and encourage collaboration with our national labs to close that gap to have better yields associated with technology transfer? Anyone? I think absolutely it does, and, it's, and one is obviously because of the funding. As my colleague mentioned, you know, follow the funding, and that, that does create incentives. But it's also, I think, that engagement. It has to be a carefully crafted opportunity that is not just finding fun, funding for the discovery purpose itself, but to ha try to have that partnership to include that whatever discoveries be uh, occur because of that have a place in the marketplace. So it has to have a market awareness and validation aspect to make sure that it's going to be successful. But I think it definitely could be a valuable part. Anyone else? Dr. Sher? Uh, yeah, I would just argue that we use the STTR a lot, uh, as in sometimes we use SBIR just sort of loosely to mean those two programs. Um, but we work very closely with our startup companies to help them um, submit SBIR as well as STTR uh, applications. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the gentleman yield back, I presume. Yes. Uh, Chair, recognize Mr. Lipinski, a gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, 
think that this is one of the most important hearings going on uh, right now up here because everyone wants to know the answer to the question where are the jobs can come from in our country and great concerns over that and I certainly think that uh, we need to be doing more to leverage the uh, great research universities uh, of our uh, of our nation and uh, also make sure we do what all that we can to uh, get the return on investment for all the federal dollars that go into research uh, in uh, in our nation. So let me start out with uh, there's a lot, a lot of different questions because I think this is this is critically important. But I want to uh, first talk about the National Science Foundation program uh, called the Innovation Core or I Core, and the per purpose purpose of the I Core the new program at NSF. It's to take individuals who have uh, received uh, NSF funding for research before and to uh, teach them how to, uh, how to be entrepreneurs essentially, how to uh, commercially develop their ideas. Uh, are any of you familiar with the i -Corps program? Yeah, I just wanted to know, I, I see, I know Mr. Nisbet, I see uh, nodding his head. Uh, do you have any comments on the value of the program or suggestions to improve it? So let me start Mr. Nisbet. In our case, it's fairly new. We are establishing an i -Corps center in Ann Arbor for the Midwest to provide that training that's associated with the i -Corps program. The one thing I find most valuable is, is twofold. The, uh, the focus on market awareness and understanding the market needs before getting too far into the funding that typically occurs through NSF grants and others. And secondly is developing the, the uh, entrepreneurial support and the mentorship to try to provide some early stage guidance to those projects. But I think it has the potential to, uh, one, attract more people into uh, the whole area of trying to commercializing research, but also to put it on a more focused uh, path towards a real market need. Well, I was hoping Mr. Nesmith was familiar with it since July 16th, one of the, a, uh, uh, that starts at, um, another round that starts at uh, Michigan. Thank you. Anyone else, Mr. Rosenbaum? Yes, I'd, I'd just like to say that uh, i -Corps, as well as many other entrepreneurship programs around the country and, and most universities today are very important, but they are just the first step of getting products to market. A business needs to mature, and I find that a lot of the entrepreneurship programs teach folks how to start a business, but don't necessarily teach them how to grow a business and manage a business. So I think that the i -Corps program is great, but we're going to need some follow-on support behind it if we're going to have a long-term success. As we've said, these things don't happen in a, in a year or two years. Sometimes they take 10 years, and an entrepreneurship program talks about the first year of life. Okay. Anyone else? We'll move on to uh, another is issue Mr. Rosenbaum had uh, mentioned. Um, he mentioned that the Maryland Innovation Initiative supports the use of funds for early stage proof of concept and prototyping work. Um, I was able to get language into the um, uh, SBIR uh, reauthorization last year that uh, grants authority to NIH for a proof, proof of concept program. Um, what, uh, I want to ask everyone on, on the panel, what is your thoughts on the early stage funding for proof of concept programs? Is it something that all federal agencies should be uh, exploring. So I'll start with uh, Mr. Rosenbaum. Yes, proof of concept is important, but one of the unique elements of the Maryland Innovation Initiative and other programs that TEDCO has had is that we don't fund those proof of concept projects until we know there's a market availability and viability for the product. A challenge with uh, Federal Lab in particular is they don't have resources to look outside at market needs. So you will need a third party to validate a market need and then absolutely fund that proof of concept for that research. But I would hate to see proof of concept going to a dead end product. We've had some great experiences <clears throat> with the Coulter translational fund that we've operated at the, at the University of Michigan for about five years. We have addressed that issue of the market uh, validation by actually closely coupling the project management resources that were involved with uh, shepherding the, in, the inventions and the work that was going on in the lab with work uh, with uh, inside our tech transfer office for doing the market awareness and, and, and assessing the market needs. 
They also used a, uh, a board of directors, a, a council, to help steer those projects on a quarterly basis. So the results we saw was much uh, accelerated projects with better decision making and some real market successes. We think that that early stage funding, uh, although not very large, can go a very long way in, in ensuring success. I think it's a tremendous idea to support the proof of concept center and proof of concept funding. This is an area that, that is really important, especially in these long-term development projects such as early stage therapeutics. We really need to get more information before you can tell if they will be a, able to address the market they are attempting to serve, and this proof of concept center would be tremendous. I would just add that the single most common feedback we get from potential licensees is the technology is too early. Uh, so proof of principle, proof of concept funding uh, is, the, is the gating factor to getting more technology to a go or no go decision point. The other thing I would add is that too often proof of principle funds provide the same level of funding for life sciences and physical sciences type of inventions and it takes a lot more money to get a life science uh, invention uh, to a proof of concept stage. Thank you for your, uh, your testimony. I yield back. A gentleman yields back. I don't see anyone else that needs to testify or wants to testify, but want to thank you for your time, and thank you for timely presenting your testimonies where we could be ready to ask you the proper questions, and thank you for the time it took to travel here, and you've been very generous. And uh, with that, uh, would ask you that we may ask you to respond to some of the things in writing we send you to timely do that if you can. There'll be others that aren't here. The others that are empty chairs indicate that they've got other hearings and things that are going on now, but they're interested in your testimony and they're appreciative of your testimony and may have some other questions to ask you. M Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Because there was uh, not a lot of folks that came to the committee hearing today, is it possible to get another round of questions? I don't think so. Do you have any other questions? I, I do, Mr. Chairman. All right, I recognize you for f how many minutes? You can give me two, Mr. Chairman. I'll give you five minutes. Appreciate that, sir. Um, or we'll give anybody else time be, if they have questions they really want to ask. I appreciate that, Chairman, and thank you for calling this hearing. As I said earlier, um, I hope that we're able to have a similar discussion when it comes to natural labs. National Labs and the uh, technology transfer associated with the relationships with, with our universities as well. There's a program that uh, recently was granted to one of the universities in the United States where there's a collaboration around entrepreneurship training. I appreciate the recognition of what's been done to introduce entrepreneurship into undergraduate programs, but also making sure that across disciplines, engineering, uh, medical fields, that we're including entrepreneurial studies. Uh, to see what we can do there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've encouraged the entity associated with the responsibilities with Epicenter that they invite members of Congress to be able to put together an entrepreneurship training um, so that way uh, we begin to be able to think outside of the box associated with policy as well. But specifically, um, Dr. Chair, I'm interested in the role of the federal government in funding trans transitional research beyond basic research to bridge the valley of death and help mature promising new technologies. There already exist a number of such federal programs with ARPA-E and with DARPA. Now we begin to see the DHS, s and Directorate as well beginning to take shape to spur innovation in particular air, um, uh, sectors. However, there's not a lot of promising technologies or there are a lot of promising technologies that don't necessarily fit into those programs necessarily from a top-down approach. Um, what are your thoughts associated with the importance of strengthening the nation's economic competitiveness from a bottom-up technology transfer uh, approach? Uh, there's a lot of different directions I, I could go with that question. Um, th one of the challenges, I think, with translational funding is, and, and I think it's what you were alluding to, is there are pockets of it, and you can participate in this particular one <clears throat> if you happen to come out of a particular area. And maybe this one over here, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're in engineering or something, uh, of, of that sort. So not every technology necessarily has a route or a path or the same path uh, in access to, to translational research funding. Uh, but the other thing uh, that, that I, I fear we're going to abandon uh, in, in these times that we're in is, is just the, uh, the need to continue to focus on the fundamentals and invest in the fundamentals and we need to have properly staffed tech transfer offices and we need adequately uh, sized uh, uh, patent budgets. 
The good news is, is if again, if you look at the autumn data, it hasn't started to really taper off. It is in a few categories. If federal funding goes down, it'll be interesting to see if that disclosure rate goes down and then everything else falls, flows from there. Uh, so we don't yet, so the good news is, is, is despite what's going on in the economy, tech transfer activity has been strong even over the last two or three years. I don't know what the next two or three will look like. Appreciate that. Mr. Rosenbaum, I'm very intrigued and supportive of the Maryland Innovation Initiative, so congratulations there in part because there's some similarities in this area between Maryland and New Mexico and having a large number of researchers, yet a relatively low degree of entrepreneurial activity that we're hoping to spur up. We have two national labs. We have the Air Force Research Labs, Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center, um, in conjunction with Kirtland Air Force Base, uh, where work is done with Sandia uh, to the Satellite Operations Office, three bases uh, from a military perspective, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, energy directive program associated with both things of that nature but yet we're not seeing the promise there. Um, over what time frame does the state of Maryland expect its innovation initiative to start yielding a positive return on its $5 million investment? And what are the key factors in making it a success? And what's the role of the federal government to support that initiative? Thank you. Um, the, the key factor is some of the uniqueness in the way it's been structured. There are five universities participating, and all five universities will have uh, a modif modified version of an entrepreneur in residence. We're calling them site miners because uh, there will be multiples from each university and they'll be cross-discipline and they'll be charged with collaborating amongst each other and going to each other's universities to see pieces that may be able to be put together to create a whole solution. Uh, much of what goes on in medicine today, for instance, is as much involved in IT as it is involved in biology. So having cross-pollination across the disciplines is a key success factor there. Uh, TEDCO's history with doing uh, proof of concept projects is that we get about 25% of our projects to turn into companies. We get about 40% of them end up licensing technologies and about 25% turn into companies. So with our five to six million dollar budget, once we're up and fully running, we expect to be funding between 40 and 45 projects a year, so we expect to be spawning 10 to 15 new companies a year out of that, and we think that that will start in year two. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your graciousness and the recognition of more time. With that, I yield back. The name of Lujan in New Mexico is very dear to me, and that's why I give you 10 minutes and everybody else just five. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, the witnesses are excused, and for any additional comments and statements that we need from members, you can do it by writing to them. And at this time, we are adjourned. Thank you.